There's proof of considerable consensus in a government. It's the fact that we've passed more legislation than comparable governments over the last four terms, as I understand, Mr Speaker, and along the way, prompting a lot of interest from the opposition, given they asked us 111,600 questions. Uh, and I understand about 100,000 of them went to Shane Jones alone, Mr Speaker. <laughs> We made, despite being one of the purest forms of MMP government that New Zealand has seen for some time, we have made landmark decisions. We passed the Zero Carbon Act and set up a framework for the future, carbon budgets that I know will make a difference for generations to come. Early on, we made a decision to look forward to set a path around fossil fuel extraction in New Zealand that said there would be no further offshore oil and gas exploration. We invested in Taranaki and their transition plan, opening a new energy research centre and investing in a hydrogen roadmap for the future of New Zealand. Mr Speaker, we came to a landmark agreement with primary producers over dealing with some of the biggest contributors to our emissions profile in New Zealand, someone no one else in the world world has been able to do what New Zealand has done. We passed child poverty legislation and, Mr Speaker, much more than that, of the nine child poverty indicators in New Zealand, seven out of them are now improving under this government. And, Mr Speaker, And Mr Speaker, we know material deprivation is one of the hardest to turn around, which is why we're investing in things like food and schools to make a direct difference to those families. Mr Speaker, we passed essential freshwater reforms, and I acknowledge the efforts of David Parker because that has been an intensive generation-changing piece of work that will make a significant difference uh, for those um, many, many years to come. Mr Speaker, we are building more houses than any government since the 1970s. And not only will we on track and are on track to meet our goal of 6,400 public housing places, we've now extended ourselves and see, with the COVID recovery and rebuild, we want to build an, another 8,000 houses to house our families. Mr Speaker, we are investing in regional infrastructure up and down the country. You will find projects that are making a difference to communities, whether it's the pool in Nainai, the surf club in Tairawhiti, uh, or the rugby club for Poverty Bay. These are projects that create jobs and contribute to community wellbeing. Mr Speaker, we have made the most significant changes to mental health this country has ever seen. We not only have invested over a billion dollars in mental health, we've started the rollout of new frontline services and training those individuals who will make a difference to make sure that people, when they need that help, can get it at their iwi provider, at their GP, wherever and whenever they need. We've increased paid parental leave. We bought in the winter energy payment. We have indexed benefits to wage increases. Mr Speaker, the Children's Commissioner said some of these changes would make the biggest difference to child poverty that we have seen in decades. And even alongside that, we've seen in this House abortion law reform, changes to make sure that every single child in New Zealand will learn New Zealand history, the things that make a difference to people's lives. And we have done all of that, Mr Speaker, whilst also pre-COVID, getting our debt down to under 20 per cent relative to GDP, getting our unemployment levels down to some of the lowest levels in a decade, and some of the highest public, uh, private sector wage growth we had seen in a decade. And all of that had prepared us for what was to come. Mr Speaker, in many, many ways, this term will be remembered for what was unplanned as much as what was planned. And in acknowledging that, I actually want to acknowledge first and foremost the community of Christchurch and, of course, our Muslim community across Aotearoa, New Zealand. I want to acknowledge the community of Whakatane because those tragedies, March 15 and Whakare White Island, first and foremost, were tragedies that happened in those places to those communities, and we will never forget that. 
Mr Speaker, through all of this, though, has been our coalition partner and our confidence and supply partners. We would not be here without you. And of course, Mr Speaker, during this campaign, there will be lots of sprinkling of dust and glitter and whatever else we may choose to call it. There will be lots of shoveling of other figurative things. None of that, Mr Speaker, none of that for me personally will ever diminish what this government and these three parties and these leaders have achieved. And so I say to the Deputy Prime Minister, I say to Marama and to James, thank you. Thank you to New Zealand First and thank you to the Greens. I'm immensely proud of what we have collectively done for Aotearoa New Zealand. I also want to pay special tribute to those members of those parties who have not been ministers but MPs. I know sometimes your positions have been amongst the hardest and I want to acknowledge that your contribution has been as important in this parliament as any of ours. Mr Speaker, I now wish to finish uh, with words of thanks. I start with my own team. They are exceptionally hardworking. They are grounded. They are here because of their community and they are strong. I acknowledge all of you, my Labour team. To the people who work in this place, to the Speaker, to the Clerk's Office, to those who work in our parliamentary offices, from Hansard to Libraries to Bellamy's, we'll have a chance to come back and say thank you. But for all of this term and keeping this place powered and your democracy working, you have our thanks. And finally, Mr Speaker, this election is not what we had planned. It is fair to say this campaign that we are about to embark on is not the campaign that we planned and prepared for six months ago, nor will our manifesto be the same as it would have been had we released it in January of this year. But that is the reality of politics and the reality of this world that we're living in right now. But I can tell you this. The values that we campaigned on in 2017, the aspirations that we had coming into this place remain unchanged. Our plans to keep creating high wage jobs are as important now as they ever were. On supporting our job creators, on ridding this country of child poverty, on making a transition to a clean, green, carbon neutral economy. Mr Speaker, we've started that journey and now we want to finish it. Let's keep moving. Moving. Order. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The Honourable Judith Collins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, firstly, I'd like to turn to acknowledge those who are here today, and I wish to start, not to end, with thanks. And that's those thanks are to yourself, Mr Speaker, for the job you do, even though sometimes I'm sure it's quite um, difficult. <laughs> we certainly find it quite difficult, actually. <laughs> um, can I also thank all the other parliamentarians who are here, and for those who have decided to leave us um, at the end of this term, um, thank you for your contribution and to helping making this such a good, um, a good place. Of course, there's a lot of uh, members of the Labour Party, as the Honourable Chris Hipkins is just mentioning, who will be leaving. Uh, they may not be planning it, but they'll be going their way home. Thank you very much. Can I also thank um, all of the national team? Thank you, team. It's about time. It's about time. <laughs> Um, thank you for putting your faith in me, and thank you particularly to the Honourable Simon Bridges and uh, Todd Muller for the support that they have been able to give me in helping us through to this transition. Uh, your efforts are greatly appreciated. Can I also take the opportunity to thank all those who work in Parliament and around the precinct? Can I particularly thank the Clerk of the House, the Office of the Clerk Staff, the Table Office, the Bills Office, Hansard Select Committee Staff, the Messengers Security, the Catering and particularly the Cleaning Staff, who often work in hours when we are not here. Can I thank the amazing team at the Library and all of my staff um, who, I must say, recently have grown to such an enormous number, I can't remember everyone's names, but that comes with the office. 
Can I thank everybody who, have, who has kept Parliament running through the COVID-19 lockdowns and making sure that we could actually have some form of democracy, even though it seemed extremely limited at the time. And a big thank you to the National Party team, uh, then led by the Honourable Simon Bridges, who made sure that there was actually an opposition voice, despite the best efforts for there to be otherwise. So thank you for everybody for doing that. I've just heard the Prime Minister make, which I think is going to be one of those speeches that we're going to look on, we're going to say, well, that was very interesting, wasn't it? Because she is going to be more famous than usual, and that is going to be because she will be a one-term Labour leader. Yeah. And that is what I'm here to tell her today. I'm here to tell her today that the last one was Bill Rowling, and good for her, she's about to join him. Yeah. Now, I think it is really important that when we look at our energised and extremely, um, extremely united team, which is full of extraordinary talent, I look instead, I look instead, Phil Twyford's asking, where have they gone? Well, Phil Twyford, he's clearly one of the best performers of Jacinda Ardern's government. Now promoted to number four. Well, what does that say about the rest of them? What does it say about the rest of them when they've got Phil Twyford at number four and he's ahead of Dr. Megan Woods and Chris Hipkins and just about everybody else? What does that say? And what does it say about the excellent work of the Honourable Calvin Davis, a number two? Isn't that amazing? Wonderful. We have so much talent, so much talent. Let's just have a look at what, though, is facing New Zealand. This is going to be an extremely important election because it's about who is going to be best able to manage what has been described by the New Zealand Reserve Bank as the biggest economic downturn in 160 years. That is even older than our dear friend, Right Honourable Winston Peters. That is 160 years built, 160 years. And what did I just hear from the Prime Minister, the leader of the Labour Party? What did I hear from the leader of the Labour Party? A whole lot of pixie dust and talking about how everything's just going to be fine. That's what I heard, an awful lot of dust. A dust, that was all it was. Let's just look at this. Let's look at the numbers that, the, that Jacinda Ardern did not wish to say. Let's look at the 212,000 New Zealanders who are now receiving the unemployment benefit. 212,000 New Zealanders. Surely they need a bit better than be told, it's all fine, we're in charge. They need something better than that. And how about the 450,000 New Zealanders who are having to receive the wage uh, subsidy? 450,000 New Zealanders whose jobs are being kept in place because of the $13 billion that the government has borrowed in order to keep them in employment. We agreed with it. We agreed with it because we had to do something. We had to do something. But in that time, in that time, a good finance minister, a good finance minister would have thought of a plan to take us out of it. Because it's really easy to close a border. It's really easy to close a border and to say to people, well, we only live so far away from the rest of the world. Of course, it's easy to close the border. It's easy to close down the economy. The hard thing is to get that economy back going again, particularly when our two, two of our biggest export markets like international tourism and international education have been effectively closed down. And who have we got to in charge from the government to look after international tourism? Well, we've got the Honourable Kelvin Davis. So what could go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? I can't even remember who's in charge of international um, education from that side, because I've never heard of them. So we've got the one shining light in the New Zealand economy is agriculture. Agriculture, a, an industry that has been in a sector that has been bagged for years by that government. Where they hated agriculture. Remember that? They put Damien O'Connor in charge of it, shows you how much they thought of it. Absolutely hated it. Remember that? How the farmers were the dirty dairying, dirty dairying, all this sort of stuff. Now suddenly, farmers are back being trendy. Now suddenly farmers are woke. Actually, thankfully, farmers will never be woke. They'll always be on trend, and the trend is national. And that's where they're going to be. I want to say to this government, RMA reform. We're getting rid of it. Now suddenly, after three years, they're saying, oh, a working group told us it was a bad thing. A working group told them it was a bad thing. I wrote to David Parker last year, about this time, and I said, 
two biggest parties in Parliament should agree on RMA reform. Let's sort it out together. He sent me back a letter on his letterhead with a basically a one-fingered salute. That's the sort of that's the sort of response you get from a government like that. A nasty, nasty little response. So we will be getting rid of it. We will get rid of it, and we will be putting in place an Environmental Standards Act, and we will be putting in place a Planning and Development Act. And they will not be the same that that lot would. They're entirely different. I would like to say too, let's just think about some of the shovel-ready projects we've been hearing about. Where are they? Where is this list? Poor old Phil Twyford, Honourable Phil Twyford, and Shane Jones put out a letter, press release, on April Fool's Day this year saying out to the local councils, give us your shovel-ready list and we'll get you the funding, we'll be there with you, we'll help you. What's happened to that shovel-ready list? Ah, uh, not much at all. 75% of them haven't been announced, and dear old Shane Jones has gone and announced to us all the reason they're not announced is it doesn't quite work with either his schedule or the Prime Minister's schedule. Well, that's a bit of a shame, isn't it? How about getting people back into work? Not only do we have 212,000 people on the unemployment benefit at the moment, we've got 200,000 highly skilled people, most in the construction area, who are underemployed. That means there's not actually enough work for them. Why wouldn't we have those people in work? They should not be reliant on a ministerial visit to tell them they've got a job. That is not good enough. That is absolutely washing your hands of the situation, Mr Jones. And what are we going to do? Well, I'll tell you what, we're not going to stick up taxes. Not like that, that party will. Why didn't, this, why didn't the Prime Minister talk to us about her secret tax list? The asset tax, the wealth tax, or dare I say it, the death tax. I mean, having to, having to pay a tax just because you die, that's a terrible thing. Now, let's have a look at this little track road that she's talked about. Kiwi Build. Was that good? Kiwi Build. She went to the last election promising 100,000 houses in 10 years. 16,000 the first term. How many they got? 380. Oh, 85, apparently. How about roads? What happened there? They stopped. Electric cars. Remember they were going to electrify the fleet, the government fleet? I understand they've got 45. They've got 45. And then we had light rail. Remember where that was? Somewhere stuck on the ghost train up Mount Roskill. And talk about New Zealand first. I know the Right Honourable Winston Pearce wants to talk. He'll tell you he's a handbrake on them. No, he's not. He's the enabler. There's only one reason the Greens are in government, and that's because Mr Peters went their way. So let's just say this. The Prime Minister may wish to give us all our sweetness and light talk, but actually it's time for reality. The New Zealand people need to know they have a government that needs to know what to do, and this government on this side does. And I, my message, my final message to the people of New Zealand is this. There's one way to take charge of life, two ticks blue. Order. Order. The Right Honourable Winston yeah, Peters. Thank you very much. That was eyebrow raising stuff. <laughs> and I don't use Botox. <laughs> all the criticism for almost 10 minutes and not one new idea. <laughs> Out there in the provinces and the hamlets of this country, all those people who are expecting something at least now at the start of this campaign from the leader of the National Party just got carp, cant and criticism. But no vision, no plan, no policy. And we're still after nine years of doing nothing about the RMA. She says we're at fault. <laughs> Extraordinary. This is from somebody who's a trained lawyer saying that sort of stuff. Don't go now, this is your best chance to learn something. <laughs> Can I say to all the staff here, the cleaners, the caterers, the guards, the drivers, the library and handside, and the many office staff, mm -hmm. and you, Mr. Speaker, and you all staff who have been of great assistance to us, sometimes not as much as usual, but usually of great assistance to us, <laughs> thank you very, very much. And can I say to my colleagues in New Zealand First, our caucus has been united by consensus, decision-making, hard work and civility. I'll be around 
I'll be around long after you're gone, sunshine. And I was here for decades before you arrived. Don't you feel bad? <laughs> the quality of our caucus has been very, very good, so thanks to you as well as our parliamentary and ministerial staff and to the seventh floor of the Beehive. Thank you for your, in inverted commas, frank advice. Uh, it's been an excellent office to work for, the very best. And can I say that it's coming uh, at the, the night time at about five to six when we stop for a quiz. They are absolutely brilliant, as Grant Robinson can attest to. <laughs> can I say, Mr Speaker, we made the right decision on 19th of October 2017. Amen. You know, I cannot believe that you'd be so youthful and shouting out these shibboleths when you know nothing, or you're the living proof of what George Bernard Shaw said, he knows nothing, he thinks he knows everything, which truly points to a career in politics. <laughs> Good God. It was a tough choice for caucus and for our board colleagues, but three years, but not as big a joke as you are, my colleague, uh, but three years on we have no regrets. National had run out of answers, so was making and framing the wrong questions, and only a change of course was going to allow the policy transformation that we sought. When this term began, and through the first months, you can remember the cacophony of sound uh, from some in the media, the government wouldn't last. Well, last we have. Yeah. Providing stable and constructive government again is now an undeniable fact and we're proud of our record. We recall the media trepidation, Prime Minister, when you said that you were going to have a baby. Yeah. Well, the sky was going to fall in. <laughs> the government hit the rocks and that was the basic refrain of the proletariat, but the ship of state didn't founder. It kept on sailing calmly on throughout until you came back. We stand on our record in office for what we've achieved, for honouring the commitments, for leaving the country in a better position after inheriting nine years of neoliberal neglect. But what's worse with these neoliberals? They don't even understand the philosophy. It shows up every day because so many of them have never been in business and their chief articulator wouldn't know what a business was or is. And that's the truth. No less than the New Zealand Herald, though, just recently said, and it's not one of our most vocal fans, the New Zealand Herald, but they trumpeted our 80 per cent plus success rate and getting our coalition agreement policies delivered. Yeah. It's because of our steady focus on delivering the coalition agreement, and we've never softened from it. And if you doubt that, ask some of my colleagues on this side of the chamber. <laughs> We're here to get by and to work hard with two other parties, the Labour Party being our coalition partner and also the support party for the Labour Party in terms of the Greens. We were never forced to agree. If we did, we wouldn't be three separate parties. We want the narrative to be more intelligent, more wise and more factual and actual. But we've got here, my Prime Minister, the Prime Minister announced that we've got over 190 bills passed. That suggests that we have got by on agreeing on most of the things. Or if we couldn't, we got compromise and got there in the end. 190 is a staggering testimony to progress. History will judge the coalition agreement as one of the most significant agreements in modern political history. And here's why. We signalled a long-term strategic plan to rebuild our country, and we had the audacity to demand it, to demand that we had things like a billion trees unthought of, yeah. to demand that we spend three billion out in neglected provincial New Zealand. The places we go to and get elbowed aside every day by National Party members whilst they come down here and use the clown, sorry I can't say that, uh, use the MP from Epsom to downgrade with a cacophony of envy every time. As though, in, as though Epsom and he knows anything about the car tyres, the Invercargles, the western east coast of this country, the very people who drive the economy to pay his salary. He dumps on it. And the Prime Minister said they're going to go out in two boats for blue. Well, I've just been to Tauranga recently, or didn't, uh, and the Bay of Plenty, and guess what I saw? Guess what I saw? I saw the photographs, the posters up there of three National Party leaders. <laughs> Mr. Bridges, Mr. Muller, and Judith Collins. 
Three all up in the same province, in the same area, in the Western Bay of Plenty. No one of the people down there are confused, <laughs> terribly confused. Uh, leave, Mr Bishop, leave it alone. I mean, that member's got a long way to go before he's going to be a front bench material. He just hasn't got the learning capacity. He doesn't seem to be able to absorb the most fundamental thing is, in this business, do your homework. Get the facts right. Be impervious to attack because you've got the facts right. And let me say, uh, Mr Speaker, when the Provincial Growth Fund came under attack, guess what they tried to do about it? They tried to say it was a slush fund. It is. There's Jerry Brownie saying it is a slush fund. Well, you know, the people of Christchurch would have wished he'd have done something too because he was in charge of its rebuild and I've never seen someone so incompetent. Of course, of course people don't realise Jerry Brownlee's experience in business is five weeks running an illegal casino before Winston Peters outed him and the president of the National Party, one good fellow. Five weeks running an illegal casino and a colleague across the house, namely yours truly, outed them and that's his total business experience. Those National Party people up in the gallery who were cheering don't know that, do they? They're not cheering now. All they do. <laughs> Can I say, Mr Speaker, in this time we preserved the Super Gold Card, we got it improved, we got over 5,000 new businesses, 130,000 people using the app and we got another improvement coming into the future. But on top of that, in the last budget, we secured one eye test for supernutants a year. It'll save 5,000 to 7,000 people going blind by early identification and one free doctor's visit. If only one of those people in the 100 doesn't go to the hospital as a result of that test, it's fiscally neutral. These are the far-sighted plans that New Zealand First has, and we thank the Labor Party and the, I said, the Greens for ensuring that this was maintained. It's critical, but we know for whom the ferry will call if they get into power. Because their last outing when it came to super wasn't very good. They promised to get rid of the surtax. And when they got in, they put it up to 92 cents in the dollar. And that fellow in Epsom, that's exactly what he will do because he's going to save $82 billion of expenditure. Uh, I can see why those people aren't smiling anymore because they're seriously shaking. If he's going to save... $82 billion of expenditure, guess who's going to feel the pain for that? And it won't be Jerry Brownlee. It won't be their front bench. No, no. It'll be all those people who are fooled to go and vote for them in the first place. And every economist has said that's impossible. Oh, yes, they have. Oh, well, if the number one spokesman for the National Party is a woodwork teacher, you can see what their problem is. Hear that? He thinks that noise and bluster substitutes for policy. Excuse me. The National Party may, may be making a comeback sometime, but it's not any time soon. And I'm saddened by that because the people of this country need a sound, strong opposition. They need people of talent and capability, and they need far better than what they're getting now. So to our people out there, our message is, hang on. The campaign starts on Saturday morning and helps on its way. Thank you very much. Download your favourite apps with Huawei Petal Search. Download now.